you two, you two can empower yourselves. You can empower your inner Mr. Spock. Well, look, I, I, sh I should stop, but I think I, I wanted to end with, with the story of Schelling and the idea of, of human imperfection. I do believe that we are largely rational. I do believe that in the most surprising situations, we do weigh up costs and benefits. But then, at the same time, we are human beings. And if we economists want to, to improve the world, to make the world a better place, if we even want to understand it, we have to take very small steps. It's not enough to be driving to the PhD exam, running late, and to construct the theory in your head. That's important. That tells you a lot, but it doesn't tell you everything. You then need to go out and engage with a highly imperfect and highly uncertain world that we have all around us. Um, I've talked for too long, but I, I am willing to take a few questions. We're happy to take a few questions. Thank you all very much for listening. Question right at the back. Um, it's, it's a very good question. So, did everyone hear that? Yeah. The question is, the question is, why don't I just lie to Dean Carlin? Um, he's not a friend, by the way. He's a professional. He's incorruptible. Um, he's a nice guy, but he's, you know. Uh, so, here's, the, here's, where, here's where on the fact that we're actually human beings comes in. One story that's told about Schelling, although I haven't been able to confirm that it's true. I, I, when I met him, I hadn't heard the story, so I didn't ask him. One story that's told about Schelling is that he tried at one point to quit smoking by writing a check to the American Nazi Party. <laughs> putting, addressing it, putting a stamp on the envelope and leaving it by the front door. And he said, if I smoke another cigarette, I'm going to mail the envelope. Now, I don't, I don't know if that's true. And if it is true, I don't know whether, he, whether that was the day he quit or whether he actually buckled. Um, but you, you, know, you have to have a balance. I could, I could have written a check to the British National Party, which I think I would have found much more motivating. I could have written a check for, say, £50 to the British National Party, and that would have motivated me as much as a check for $1,000 to a, the Washington, D.C. Central Kitchen, which is actually a wonderful charity. However, if it was £50 to the British National Party, I would just lie. I'd get to the end of the week, and I'd go, those guys aren't going to get my money, um, and I'd just lie. But this is a charity. I can't lie and do a charity out of money. I can do push-ups and do a charity out of money, but I can't lie and do charity out of money. So I, I guess what I'm, I'm emphasising is that, uh, yeah, I, I am 90% Spock, but there are parts of me that are highly illogical. Um, there are, uh, there's a question there. I'm sorry, I'm just going to do the questions in order. I'm sure you don't have anybody in mind particularly. Actually, the, <laughs> the sad thing is that we're not short of, of possible candidates. So did everyone hear the question? No. So the question is when... Um, uh, I clearly have excellent hearing. Um, the question is when African leaders, when many African leaders weigh up the costs and benefits, how come uh, the, the ledger seems to so often come out in favour of corruption, right? And self-dealing. Self this is a really interesting question. Now, there's a, there's a trivial answer to it, and there's a really serious answer to it, and they're both interesting. So the serious answer which I give in the book talks about the, the incentives that uh, many African economists face. Uh, and not just African, but it often is Africa. And the argument is that these incentives were actually laid down many, many decades ago by the institutions that the colonial powers laid, laid out. Not a lot of people know that the Pilgrim Fathers nearly went to Guyana. And they decided not to go to Guyana because they realized that settler mortality in Guyana was more than 50% per year because of all the tropical diseases. So in the end, they decided to go to, to Cape Cod. And um, you know, off they went and, and helped to found America. And more generally, the argument is, this is put forward by a, a Turkish economist, brilliant young Turkish economist, uh, Darren Asimoglu, um, who followed Steve Levitt as the winner of the John Bates Clark Medal. He argued that the presence of tropical diseases uh, in many parts of the world that were colonized led the colonial powers to set up 
basically exploitative, extractive institutions. They didn't want to live there, they just wanted, first it was the slaves, after the slaves it was the ivory, then it was the gold, then it was the oil. When they handed over power in the 60s and 70s, they handed over these institutions, those still exploitative institutions. So what do you use exploitative institutions for but exploitation? Now, in somewhere like America, Canada, what happened is very nice climates, well, I don't know about Canada, but America, very nice climate, Settlers wanted to stay. They didn't want to exploit America. They wanted to stay. Obviously, they had to wipe out the indigenous population, but then they wanted to stay, and they wanted to set up institutions for themselves that maximize prosperity, hence the Bill of Rights. And so that, I think, is a very powerful explanation for why it is that so many tropical areas, even today, are in poverty. It's an institutional explanation. Another, I mean, another really interesting thing, and here's the, here's the, little, the funny little answer, so economists have always asked themselves, to what extent is corruption institutional? To what extent is it, is it all about the, the laws, the pure incentives that people face? And to what extent is it cultural? There's, those d distinctions are blurred. I mean, there is a blur, blurring between institutions and culture. But if you wanted to answer that question, what would you, what would you want to do? You want to take people from all over the world, and you want to put them somewhere where they're all subject to the same laws, the same institutions, and see how they behave. Now, this seems to be a very difficult thing to do. And then it was realized, hang on a moment, uh, we could just study the behavior of diplomats in New York City who have diplomatic immunity for parking tickets. So <laughs> you see why I say it's trivial, but at the same time, it's very clever. So they just looked at how different diplomats behaved, and all of whom could violate parking regulations with, with complete impunity. So it turns out that uh, Chad, I think, was a particular offender, Kuwait was a particular offender, very small numbers of diplomats committing thousands of parking offences over a period of a few years. Meanwhile, far, far more diplomats from Scandinavia committed a very small number of parking offences over the same period. Um, I think it was 12 in seven years. And it turns out that 11 of them were committed by one really badass Finn. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's really true. Now, so that suggests, oh, it's all culture, institutions don't matter. But actually, there's a, there's a, moral, there's a kicker to the story. Which is, um, Hillary Clinton and Charles Schumer, who were senators at the time, got a, a law passed that, A, okay, we can't impose these parking fines, but we can tow their cars and crash them if we really want to. But we certainly tow the cars. Also, we will add up all the uh, owed parking tickets, and we will deduct that sum of money from the foreign aid budget that these countries receive. So they changed the incentives. The moment they changed the incentives, parking offences, unpaid parking tickets fell by 90%. Uh, and so culture matters, but incentives matter too. So that's the silly answer, but a very important question, so thank you for it. Um, I th I, I, I'm happy to answer as many questions as we like, but I know that some people would want to go home, so let me answer, let me answer one more question.